Welcome and thanks for joining us. My guest today is Gabrielle Rivera. She is Vice President at Maximus. Good to have you with us. Likewise, thank you very much for having me. And today we're going to talk about automation, getting efficiency in the processes and systems of government, something that is going on for really generations. And, you know, we no longer have typing pools in government and we have email. So in a sense, automation has been happening for at least the 35 years I've been watching government. And it was happening probably 35 years before that, punch cards. So in your opinion, and looking across agencies as you see them, what's the next frontier for efficiency, for automation, for wringing cost and effort out of processes? So I, I think that there's a lot there to unpack. The first thing that I can think of is one, a very clear assessment, especially as technologies, processes, whether they're official mandates and or roadmaps, um, adoption of new technologies, the assessment is going to be critical there um, with introducing new automation and or the improvement um, of automation that's currently in the environment. We see this in a move to cloud. We see this in a move in consolidation. We see this in a move in retiring um, legacy architecture as a perfect example. I think when we're looking at automation and some of the advancements there, I think that having a clear understanding of when automation should be applied and what type of automation and what can be a facilitator uh, is imperative to understand. As an example, the difference between RPA, AI, ML, deep learning, and where we can apply those, and then also where is there a business case, where is there an ROI, how we are measuring that, and what the impact is. Outside of even just an ROI in discussing uh, you know, a monetary cost and or time, I think one of the things that we're really focused at at this juncture is also how we're introducing automation at our respective agencies and bureaus to improve the customer experience, external facing, uh, and then conversely, the employee experience as well. Yeah, that's right, because they say better satisfied, happy employees are going to naturally want to give better experience to those. Right. And it's important to enable those employees with systems that let them work efficiently, that let them deliver what they would like to, and very often, you find, and I'm, my question is, you know, what are the pain points you're seeing? And I'm guessing one of them is systems that don't support the employee's desire to give good customer experience or good experience to trading partners, vendors, and so forth, because they're, they're stymied by what they have in front of them on their screens. Sure. I think also, you know, one of the other pain points uh, that I think we experience most often is training. Uh, so as an example, if we're introducing automation, are they trained on what is being produced by the automation or what they're reviewing and seeing? As they're also freed up for higher level tasks, are they trained subsequently on those higher level tasks now that some of those other tasks that are perhaps more simple in nature are now automated? Well, what are the pain points? What are the areas, processes? I would think it's not something you can ask the IT department unless it's an IT function and process and there's plenty of room there. But I would think it would be the people in the programmatic areas that have to live with process day by day to get their programs done. You know, I think it's actually all of the above as a holistic approach. So as an example, when we're looking at some of the pain points of automation, I think it's the same pain points that we deal with in any implementation. Um, that is conversely between cybersecurity, between the business line, between IT, and having everyone come together in an agreement and understanding of what should be automated and why, which are sometimes a couple different questions. I do think that IT does have a role as some of the things that are being automated. Are they introducing a risk to the IT systems? Is the new tool and or technology or implementation going to fit within the environment, the upstream and downstream effects, what it's automating? Uh, and then also a human in the loop component with the automation to validate what's being produced. So I really do think that between cyber and the business program operations, uh, and of course IT, I think that there has to be a cohesive roadmap there in conversation. Yeah, so there's really two sides to cyber. One there is to make sure that you don't introduce cyber risks in some automation project, say replacing a legacy, I don't know, ERP or financial system with something sure. that's more functional in a contemporary sense. And then there's also automating and getting some of the routine tasks out of cybersecurity as a function. Sure, and I think that we see that in continuous ATO. I think we see that in automated testing um, is another one. 
I, again, I think that that's also where a human in the loop component is critical because as we are automating certain things to go back and check from a cyber perspective, you know, did we indeed, you know, remove any areas for breaches in a continuous ATO process? You know, have any of the ATO requirements been updated and are the automated functions still addressing those correctly? Um, you know, cybersecurity is a challenge because it is there to protect um, the agency, it's there to protect us, it's there to protect our PII or PHII. And then at the same time, to your point when there's two sides to it, um, it can pose some challenges, but I think it's necessary uh, for those protocols to be in place. ATO itself is a really good example of the kind of thing that people are desperate to automate or speed up because it has all the elements of technology deployment, which is always fun, testing, mm -hmm. making sure you don't break anything else when you introduce something new, sure. and also big compliance. And compliance in all areas, is, as you mentioned, is a big area, I would think, for whatever you can automate and, and leave the human decision to the final type of uh, stage. Absolutely. So ATO, uh, especially automated ATO or continuous ATO, how you want to refer to it in your respective agency or bureau, it is one that is ripe for automation, particularly due to a program desire. It can be laborious in nature. However, the protocols and ramifications that are put there in place are also there for a reason. And so, again, ensuring that you are having these specific requirements updated, um, that the automation that is applied to that in the continuous ATO process is continually updated, refreshed, and checked is important. One of the things that we've seen that's actually been successful is doing continuous ATO in a test bed, um, almost in a pilot environment. Um, and again, this has to be in conjunction with a business sponsor, um, with an operations sponsor. And cyber has to be uh, involved at every step uh, and every juncture. And again, checking to ensure that when that automation is put in place, that it is in fact um, automating what it is supposed to and updating accordingly as requirements change. Walk us through a scenario of how you begin. Uh, you say an IT department would like to say, you know, we're always, we have the sec dev ops operation, we have pipelines, and it all kind of crashes on the shoals of ATO. No matter how much you put out software, if you can't get it into production, you've got a build up, you might say. So walk us through what is the process for what would you do when you walk into an agency, and that's their challenge. How do you begin to start using the ATO so that the pipeline has a place to escape into production. So, you know, I had mentioned it previously, I think assessment is the biggest thing. Um, when we're looking at a pipeline and how we're going to automate that, I think that what we have to do is take a certain section and or piece. Um, I don't want to call it low hanging fruit because these are mission critical applications. What we can do is take a small component and a small portion and conduct an assessment within a fixed environment. Um, within the continuous ATO process so that we can test those first before we put them into a production environment. I think that we have to continually iterate here. I know that we use the word agile a lot, but I think this is a perfect application for an agile process as we move into continuous ATO before we can open any of that up into a larger environment, particularly exposing a, a pipeline. Every agency and or bureau has um, its own mission objectives, it has its own timeframes that they have to meet, and it's important that we work towards perfection in a smaller environment before we open that up. Yeah, and you also, I guess, basic functionality has to be part of the assessment. The Absolutely. assumptions that you make of what the system will do, because I'm thinking of a large component agency in a big department that had a new financial system and it wouldn't pay the bills. Right. And so the lights were turned off. I mean, this literally happened. And so the assessment has got to include what the employees and the users of the system know it has to do. Absolutely. You know, there's, I think that that's also where we track our progress in our iteration is because not only do we have to have continuous delivery. Um, I think when we're talking about the continuous improvement part, which is of course, you know, the ATO process and, and what we can automate when and where and its success factors. I think the other thing that we look at is not just the success of that that we can measure from a time frame perspective or a monetary perspective, but what were we able to avoid? What were we able to avoid from uh, you know, a ticket or system downtime? Did we maintain system uptime? I think that those are the metrics that we're looking at is what problems and issues did we avoid, not just what did we achieve? Yeah, and then that training is really important then too, so people know what the system is capable of 
where they need to get help and you know when you push the F1 key. It's critical and I, I think that for us especially the term subject matter expert uh, is absolutely foundational to us. Not just through the assessment period but also as we move towards um, deployment and production and iteration before we roll that out um, in conjunction. A lot of these you were mentioning you know a, a pipeline um, for applications, things of this nature, some of our pipelines have over 160 applications that we're moving at one time. And so there's a mm -hmm. need for us to automate those. However, again, because they are mission critical and we have to pay very special attention to blackout periods, the PII that's contained in mm -hmm. those, there's a lot of sensitivity around what we're automating, how we're automating it, and again, the success factors that we're able to deliver around that, but why we selected that particular portion in the first place. And it sounds like even the development group has to have a clear understanding of what it is that they're doing, and not just this block of code, but the bigger picture would probably help them. Absolutely. I think that especially when we look at development, and this is again where we get into the assessment phase as to what can we automate, um, what is ready to move, what still needs refactoring or re-engineering when we look at code, um, you know, what we're having from a batch um, perspective and how much we're really able to move at one time, that also comes into parallel validation is another thing that we experience within that where as we are moving into the test environment and moving into a smaller batch and or prod, that's also expensive and cumbersome at the same time. And so how do we automate that but also alleviate some of the cumbersome nature? All right, on that note, we're going to take a short break. My guest today is Gabrielle Rivera. She's Vice President at Maximus. I'm Federal Drive host Tom Temin on Federal Insights, sponsored by Maximus here on Federal News Network. Welcome back to Federal Insights, sponsored by Maximus here on Federal News Network. My guest today is Gabrielle Rivera. She's Vice President at Maximus. I'm Federal Drive host Tom Temin. And let's talk about something that's on every agency's agenda, everybody's lips right now, and that is cloud. And so many new IT projects are originating in the cloud, not so much necessarily moving up to the cloud. Discuss the issue of automation, efficient new processes, and the cloud. Because I'm hearing it's not universally that it has to be cloud. When we talk about automation and the move to the cloud, one of the benefits that we've seen of that is automating assessments in the move to cloud. So while there are originations in the cloud, there is still a lot that we have to migrate to the cloud. And you know, one of the things that you brought up was that it doesn't always have to be in the cloud. And we've heard about containerization being a dirty word, as example, or does it actually have to move? or instead of everything being cloud first, are we talking about being cloud smart? And so the automated assessment process in the move to cloud has actually been a success that we've seen. Um, it discusses the um, automation of the applications, the readiness of them. Do we need any actions beforehand? Do we need to refactor? Do we need to re-engineer any code? How much is it going to cost? to migrate the applications to the cloud and also an assessment of should they even move at all and as an example would containerization be best for said application and also introduce more cost savings, more ROI as opposed to the move to cloud. I think a lot of the challenges come into the cloud environments that we have today that do vary even within an agency in itself. Um, we have multiple cloud service providers some are going only cloud native, uh, public cloud, private cloud, hybrid cloud. Uh, we have multiple providers working together in the same cloud. And so as we're looking at automation in that move to cloud, is there a standardization there? And does the standardization make sense in order to deploy? Furthermore, I think that in a lot of large complex agencies and or bureaus where we have a lot of sub agencies and bureaus, in standardization and in automation, can we find a consistent approach that works across the enterprise, that works across in order to produce not just efficiencies within the procurement of automation technologies, but also in the approaches and the standardization of how that is deployed to generate some sort of a beneficial outcome that is not realized currently today. And when you mentioned cloud and hybrid cloud and data center, you forgot edge. And that gets to the question of data, because so many of the new projects, especially oriented toward customer experience, for example, 
bring in multiple sources of data that are divorced from the original applications they might have been associated with as we do this recombination of things into new systems. And so that's a real question of efficiency and cost when you put all your data in the cloud for a given project. Absolutely. I think that the measurement of that cost is absolutely critical. Again, assessing that, whether it's automated or through an assessment from a program or a project team or a contractor is going to be critical there. Cloud economics is what really comes to mind there. And so if what we're procuring and what we are actually deploying does not generate those ROIs and efficiencies, it's instrumental. As an example, the temperature that you're storing um, is one of the things that we do not necessarily see that's assessed. The other thing is the reporting. So when you're talking about bringing in disparate sources, what maybe worked for one program or one application does not always work for another. And the consistent reporting of such, as an example, the consumption and the storage cost being communicated every three months, does not allow an agency or a bureau to be proactive in monitoring and the ability to pivot for any changes. Yeah, it sounds like what agencies used to have in the early cell phone era with 10,000 page invoices every month. Sure. That nobody could read. And by the way, just as an aside, are cloud companies getting more transparent and are they offering more you know, cents per minute if you will, equivalent in data transfer of, of uh, movement? I think that we are seeing a lot more flexibility in the consumption methods. I think part of that is a drive from procurement. I think part of that is a drive for enterprise-wide implementations mm -hmm. to generate more efficiencies. I think that also that is a drive between working with the agencies and the contractor community, the systems integrator community, so that we can produce the best solution with that. So the consumption model is absolutely critical, especially as requirements and needs change. And we've gotten this far without talking about artificial intelligence, and in some way that's the new hammer, and almost everything people think about is now a nail for AI. What's your thinking about AI in the context of modernization and automation and efficiency, and is it necessarily something you have to do in every situation? It is not something that we are going to be able to escape. I think that the utilization of AI as an individual, you and I in our homes, on a project, even school, is completely different than an agency or a bureau introducing AI into their environment. I think that we have to be cognizant, especially as the general public, for what types of security protocols, parameters, test beds have to come into play. I think that you brought up data, you know, being everything, uh, you know, earlier. I think for us, understanding the source of the data, the integrity of the initial data, the ethical biases that may or may not exist, the testbed within uh, AI that is being utilized and deployed, how we are still having that human in the loop element there. There are a lot of considerations, the protection of our data. Uh, particularly within the federal government that we have to consider before deploying AI. The other thing that we are noticing is a desire to leverage and utilize, utilize AI, not necessarily with a particular business case in mind at mm -hmm. the forefront. And that is also something that has to be generated in order to even consider deploying AI. Right, there's many projects where plain old fashioned logic as encoded to run on a processor will give you the automation you need. Absolutely. Well, also AI is not necessarily a standalone. AI can be a facilitator to technologies that are already in place, such as RPA. And mm -hmm. so for us to have a clear understanding of how and why we're leveraging AI is going to allow us to produce the results that we're looking for, as opposed to just blanketing it or layering it on just because that's what we're looking at these days. And of course, again, as an aside, we have the generative movement, which is really separate from the AI as we've understood it, an RPA, machine learning type of environment, a whole new ball game here with generative. Does that have a play at all here? Have you seen any efficacy in the possibility of, of uh, generative? I do think it will take time. It's interesting that you bring that up as we recently had an event, I believe it was about a month ago, uh, between both industry and government counterparts. And one of the things we did was actually experience, uh, experiment with generative AI. We ran two separate test cases, if you will, uh, within test groups where we prompted 
AI generative to not just produce text and answers, but also images. Conversely, we ran a second group that was all human and human artists, and we put them up side by side. The training around generative AI is absolutely critical. The prompts, how you are prompting it, how you're monitoring and how you're scrubbing, the results are absolutely critical. You would not believe the disparity between what we came up with in the human mm -hmm. only community and what generative AI produced. It was very interesting. I still think that we have quite a bit of ways to go. All right, well, let's get back to the main question, which is automation and modernization and getting efficiency into systems. Give us some good case histories from recent times. One of the things that we've been doing, especially on one of our largest programs, is actually automating test scripts. Um, we have also been automating our pipeline assessment uh, and the move. We're working towards a fully automated uh, CI CD pipeline. We are also uh, automating the reports that come through that. Um, one of the things, as I'd mentioned earlier, is not just around the cost savings and the reporting around the automation from a time savings perspective, uh, but also what we are avoiding from any system downtime and or any break in the applications themselves. So that's one example. At Maximus, we also have a very large uh, contact center operations. And on one of our largest programs through introducing automation, we actually applied it to agent onboarding. Not only were we able to reduce the turnover rate, we were also able to increase the onboarding perspective, reduce the time frame in which the agents were trained, and also assisted in automating some of the basic capabilities within the uh, specific agency clearance process. And finally, what about metrics? How do you ensure that what it is you set out to do in your assessment is actually happening in the final system? Metrics and benefits are critical for us to measure, particularly with regards to a regular basis. Uh, dashboarding and reporting, which we've also been able to automate uh, on many levels, is critical to our program successes. Our program communicates with the customer uh, and, of course, all stakeholders that are engaged. I think it's important for us when we're talking about metrics to not just measure the health of the program, SLAs, system uptime, but that we're also measuring the employee experience, the customer experience, the external facing KPIs and or indicators. As a perfect example, automating certain tasks such as password resets um, and or you know, authentication. Not only does this reduce the burden for the agency itself, but also generates a better customer experience for those that are interacting with the specific agency and or bureau itself. All right, a lot to think about. I want to thank you for being with us today. My guest has been Gabrielle Rivera, Vice President at Maximus. Great to have you. Thank you. I'm Federal Drive host Tom Temin. You're listening to Federal News Network. For more on this discussion, please visit federalnewsnetwork.com and search Maximus.